I've been fascinated in what happens as we die for, for as long as I can remember. And this led me to doing an MA in 2000 in the rhetoric, the rhetoric and rituals of death. And straight after that, I worked with Dr. Peter Fennick on a five year end of life retrospective study into end of life experiences. And we studied the last months, weeks, days, hours and moments of what happens as we actually die. This end of life experience research study led me to really think about consciousness existing after we died, but also on a more earthly level, how we can improve the way we talk about death and dying and end of life, and really looking at the fear that stops us from doing that. And that's now my work because I now run death cafes, and I've run over 50 now, which provides a space for people to come and talk about end of life in any way they want to, with the obligatory tea and cake. And this is a space where complete strangers come and they have the space and the time just to really think about what really matters to them. Some people may be dying themselves, some people may have had been sitting by the deathbed of a much loved person. Some people come because they want to talk about a baby who's died or a stillbirth, or the fact they're terrified of dying, but they want to be in a space where they can talk about this without somebody saying, oh, that's morbid, or don't talk about that, or they're terrified of upsetting family members because they don't want to upset them, but they really feel a pressing need to express what they're feeling about their own mortality and the mystery of death and dying. And what is this process that we're all going to go through? We're all going to experience death. And what happens in those moments as we die? I find the most fascinating research that's done into end of life and what happens as we die is through Sam Panier's work. He's been studying end of life experiences and, it, and gathering stories um, about what happens to people who are declared clinically dead. And these people go out of their bodies and then they often report um, seeing a light or going down a tunnel or meeting friends who've died or, the, or an angel or whatever it is to them and, or they telepathically receive a message that it's not their time to die and they come back into their body. And he's unequivocally proven that something in the brain as we begin to die, there's a, there's a massive rush of energy and I'm really curious about what that energy is. And of course Sam Panier's work is just building on the work of Raymond Moody who back in the 60s wrote this wonderful book, Life on Life, and he was one of the first um, doctors um, to gather fantastic stories about people who'd had near-death experiences and weren't, had never spoken about them before because it was such a taboo subject. And I feel like Sam's work is now breaking that taboo. And I find the other really interesting work is by George Mashu. He's from the University of Michigan. And he was studying the brains of four people as they actually died. And he was measuring their, the, the, what was happening in their brains. And one of them, even though he'd been clinically dead for 10 minutes, they were measuring his, the, 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 his brain was still active. And what was happening there after 10 minutes of, is the, the brain was still active. And apparently, this, uh, the, whatever was happening in his brain was the equivalent of REM sleep. So <laughs> I'm just really curious about that because how I understand REM sleep, REM sleep is about, it helps us to make sense of our lives and what's happened in our lives. It helps us to process our consciousness through dream states, through symbols or whatever it is. So what is happening to the brain after it dies which is equivalent to REM sleep. And that led me to looking at John um, Hagelin's work, and he's a, a neuroscientist. 
and he specializes in transcendental meditation and he measures the what happens to the brains in tr transcendental meditation and he talks about in, when you get to that state of of just going beyond who you are it's a state of utter bliss and I'm just wondering all the research that we did into end of life experiences and people talking about just a sense of letting go, a sense of peace. Some people, the dying people in the end of life experiences often talk about just something happening or just maybe a sense of bliss. And it seems to be they're reporting the same thing. And so, is this a proof that consciousness does scientifically exist after we die? And if it does, what is that consciousness? Are these reports of end of life experiences, of near death experiences? Wow. And if this is true, this will change everybody's understanding of death and dying. I believe that we're living in an increasingly chaotic and frenetic uh, environment. Our world is changing. Um, I think people are feeling out of control. They're, we're certainly out of touch with our natural rhythms. We, everything is geared about living longer, irrespective of what that does to us. We're giving our power over to medicine. We're wanting death to be fixed or stopped, <laughs> um, which obviously isn't possible. I also think that we're now addicted, so addicted to technology that we have lost connection with nature. And that is what holds us and sustains us. And that the fact that our natural innate abilities to connect with our mortality is rapidly disappearing. And I find that people often say to me that they're terrified of dying. And then I sort of say, well, why are you so fr frightened of dying? Because they, they don't know what's going to happen. Well, if you don't think about it, if you don't absorb it, if you don't, if you don't allow it to touch your life, of course it's a terrifying concept. But when you do allow yourself to open up to the inevitability that we're going to die, something else opens up inside. And it's about a search. It's about a, a spiritual understanding that we're mortal. And actually, all we're doing is just passing through. We're born and we die. Those are the two unequivocal bookends that we have to face. We can't do anything about our birth, but we can do something about our relationship with our death and looking at that and really absorbing the fact that this is going to happen. And the, the sort of the sandwich filling in between dying, uh, our birth and our death, is how we understand life. And I feel like those people I talk to who have really taken on board their mortality, they accept it, they work with it, they, they find life much more fluid, they enjoy life a lot more because it is just a question that you have this life. Who knows about reincarnation? We have this life and this life is what's important. And I just feel like if we allow it to have a bigger picture, if we allow it to, to teach us who we truly are, then our death is much more, we're much more able to accept our death and meet it with understanding and compassion because <laughs> it is just such an adventure we're going to be going through. And that's, I can't, I just find that I'm now 66 and this is the next big adventure to me. The fact I am now getting ready for my death to walk, I'm walking towards it. I have to be because I'm certainly not getting any younger and I find that just so engaging and it get, engages me in life. And I want to go to my death as resolved as I possibly can be with the life that I have led. I can't change the life I've led, but I can really work with how I die. And that for me is absolutely essential. 
And that's why I do the work I do, which is helping people to talk more honestly and openly about death in any way that they want to.